Shut up, yeah. I know I already did this video, but it was too short. It was only a minute long. So what you saw was just a little clip, a little snippet, a little window into the bull I had to go through. See, uh, bro, you don't know, especially if you're a child, a little baby, a wee little boy. Things used to be difficult back in the day, but you would know shit about that. Your computer didn't just come with an operating system back in the day. And even if it did, you had to install drivers and shit. And hunting for them drivers was a sport. So join me on this journey where we install Windows XP in 2023 for absolutely no goddamn reason. Windows XP was launched on October 25th, 2001. And one thing to note is that XP is one of the first operating systems to be based on the NT kernel, which a kernel is something that sits between the operating system and the hardware. If you're old enough, you might remember DOS or MS-DOS, which is what the underlying Windows 9X kernel was dependent on until now. XP marked a definitive change, completely removing the reliance on DOS, and even to this day, all Windows operating systems are still based on NT, which is why going below Windows 2000 is kind of a hassle. But pish posh, enough with the nerd talk. It was time to go out adventuring and find a Windows XP PC because I'm a regular Mac user. And we need the full OG experience of running on real hardware. So I set out to find a PC, found this old PC that I used to use as a kid. I know it can run Windows XP because it used to run Windows XP. Got a little keyboard, a little mouse, and a VGA cable because these were the days before HDMI, if you remember that. Brought it all home and set it up just to find out it was running Windows 10. That's definitely sus. I know this PC is old because it literally has that old school design for Windows XP logo. So I installed CPU-Z to look at the components and... Hmm. Turns out this PC had the internals upgraded at some point. So instead of running an Intel Pentium D as advertised, it's running an Intel Core i3-3220 with 8 gigs of DDR3 RAM and a Gigabyte 861M motherboard. Not exactly a problem though. XP was so goddamn popular that even components released in 2012 and 2013 have drivers and support. In fact, this should be a really smooth XP experience because the hardware is really, really, really powerful in comparison. The hard drive inside this PC is running my family's old Windows 10 installation. So I switched hard drives to my personal one terabyte drive, which used to be part of my gaming PC. Long story. Cleaned up this PC a little bit, and now we're ready to install. Okay, everybody, hold up a moment. Calm down. I know you experts are on the way to the comment section. Why are you choosing Windows XP 64 bit? I know Windows XP and I have had our differences. 64 bit is far less compatible with DOS programs than the 32 bit version. Also, 16 bit programs will not run, and the underlying kernel is based on Windows Server 2003s. Does it look like I give a rat's ass about any of this shit? Look, yeah, I have 8 gigs of RAM, and I intend to use all of it. Moreover, this Core i3-3220 is 64 bits. Just makes sense to run a 64-bit operating system. Although, you do have to be careful picking the right edition, because there is actually two. Okay, a little bit of computer science lesson incoming. So Windows XP was released on October 25th, 2001, but the edition we're installing was released in April 2005. So what gives? There's actually two 64-bit editions, one released simultaneously with the 32-bit version in October 2001, and one released later in 2005. So why not install the 2001 version? Well, even if it's 64 bits, it's a different architecture. Let me explain. You might know that we code, like if-else statements or whatever, but that actually gets converted into another language which we call instruction sets, like ARM, if you've heard all the buzz about Intel to ARM, or the most popular instruction set, x86. If you're watching this on a computer and it's not a Mac, chances are your computer understands the x86-64 instruction set, which is what this computer understands as well. But back in 2001, x86-64 bits wasn't a thing yet. We were still all using the IA32 instruction set, the 32-bit version of x86. 64 bits was on the horizon. 32 bits has the 4GB RAM limit, so Intel, in a bit to stick it to AMD, their nearest competitor, made their 64-bit architecture, IA64, radically different to the existing 32-bit architecture, so AMD couldn't have it. The IA64 architecture processors were called the Itanium line, which is what the first edition of Windows XP 64-bit supports. But as you can guess, that never took off, because we don't use IA64, we use x86-64, which was invented by AMD. See, the problem with making IA64 radically different to its 32-bit counterpart is that it's not backwards compatible. So imagine you install your brand new 64-bit operating system, all your existing 32-bit programs just stop working. 
AMD feeling left out made their own 64-bit architecture called x86-64 and licensed it to Intel, which is what we all use today. And the great part about x86-64 is that it's completely backwards compatible, so all your existing 32-bit programs keep working. The 2005 version is built for the much more widespread x86-64 instruction set, and that is why even to this day you might find internal files or names like AMD64 because AMD invented this instruction set. Okay, that was a long tangent. Let me know in the comments and I'll make a full-blown video explaining instruction sets. But anyways, we're going with 64 bits to maximize our potential. Okay, so my dad bought Windows XP way back in the day, so it just makes sense that I use that CD, right? Well, it's the regular 32-bit version. Also, the CD's all scratched up because I played around with it as a kid. So I set up to find a blank DVD so I could burn this Windows XP 64-bit ISO onto it, but I couldn't find one anywhere. I remember as a kid you could just pop down to the local store and get one, but it turns out you can install XP from a bootable USB with a creator like Rufus. You do have to extract the ISO and copy these specific files over, but once you do, Rufus does the rest. So let me just pop the USB in and go through the setup. The first part is this really weird blue screen thing. There isn't really a graphical user interface. You have to format your partitions and stuff, but then it reboots into the XP interface. You have to pick your region and enter your product key, which doesn't really matter anymore. And within no time, you're at the desktop. Man, this wallpaper takes me back. Fun fact, it is a real place in Napa Valley, California. It just doesn't look like that anymore because it's an active vineyard. I do want to get this desktop to full HD and the UI looks fine, but it's clear that this whole setup was made with 4x3 CRT screens in mind. The wallpaper always gets stretched. In fact, I think all of the wallpapers get stretched because they're all made in 4x3 format. Right now it's pretty much useless because it has no drivers. That means no graphics memory, no sound, and no internet. What's fascinating is that I tried to connect the LAN before installing the drivers, but it kept asking me for all these weird dial-up settings, which took me a while to process that XP can't see the LAN port. But these components actually have perfect Windows XP support, so going through the vendor's websites, I got all the drivers in no time. Now that we have the LAN drivers, we can connect to the internet, which this PC does not have Wi-Fi, almost unimaginable now, so I had to lug this whole setup closer to the router just so I can connect this long-ass Ethernet cable. Okay, the first thing to do is install LegacyUpdate.net, which is this really awesome project where you can get all the latest Windows updates and drivers for your old operating system. Systems. And another brilliant thing about it is that even though Internet Explorer is completely broken, I mean it wasn't the smoothest in 2005, LegacyUpdate.net will still load so you can download it right there and install it. It gives you all these options like service packs and update root certificate store, which if I'm not mistaken lets you visit HTTPS websites, super helpful since that's the whole internet now. Look at all these updates, damn. It's also super useful to install drivers because it can detect your components. Even though it did f*** up the LAN drivers, it really came in clutch for the audio drivers, which would not install because there was some component missing, but Legacy Update fixed that, and now we have sound. And since we have sound, quick Windows XP sound montage. Okay, okay, calm down. I know, I know. Use the my podcast so good through the That is exactly why I did the shorts first so I could listen in the comments. Surprisingly, people are right. The My Cloud Browser makes the entire internet completely usable. But for now, just for fun, let's go through the archives and see what the internet was like in 2005. Like YouTube. Hey guys, make sure to rate, comment, and subscribe to my channel. Or MSN, which is what Internet Explorer was trying to load, by the way. Actually, though, this is a fully functional web browser where you can check your email, watch YouTube videos, download files, the whole nine yards. You know, I've always wondered, what made XP so great? Why is it so good? There's people who stand by it even today, and some places like the military and Vladimir Putin still use it, so what made XP so damn popular? Well, firstly, like I said, it was built on the much more stable Windows NT kernel, but it also kept some Windows NX kernel bits so that it could run old programs relatively well. It was like a perfect blend of old and new, like older programs worked just fine, but newer programs built for NT were much more stable and also thrived. It also kinda introduced compatibility mode. I mean, technically it was introduced in Windows 2000 Service Pack 2, but it also had native USB support in a time where most people were probably using PS2 keyboard and mice. The system requirements weren't terribly outrageous, it was quite alright. Most PCs of the time could comfortably run XP. Windows 2000 was also built on the NT kernel and it is quite stable, but it was really geared more towards the professionals. XP was made for both consumers and professionals. It also had the good fortune, I guess, of having operating systems built before and after XP be absolute disasters. Windows 98 wasn't terribly well received, and Windows ME was really released to stall for time until XP. 
and Mii is widely known for being problematic. As such, expectations took a nosedive. In comparison, XP really felt like a breath of fresh air. It's stable, reliable, compatible, relatively bug-free, and Vista release after XP was also widely panned by users and critics alike. I mean, I like the operating system, but given its reputation and supposed problems, people chose not to upgrade or outright downgrade their existing Vista installations back to XP. As such, XP had an unusually prolonged lifespan because people chose not to upgrade until Windows 7. Okay, so when this era was actually going, the only exposure I had to video games was through the GameCube, which you can watch my retrospective on that link in description. So, yeah, I have no idea what PC gaming was like during this time. Although, I did play some games from this era later on, so I fished out my old hard drive with all my old games on it, and first up is Need for Speed Most Wanted. 2005. You know, I haven't gamed on PCs for a while, so I forgot that especially old Windows was DLL hell. What's also interesting is that the games wouldn't detect the 64-bit DLLs, only 32-bit ones, which made me realize all these games are just 32-bit programs. But anyways, after going through all the DLLs, hmm. So I quickly ran DXDIG, which by the way, you can still do in modern Windows, and there we go. There is no graphics driver, it's kinda hard to run games when you have no graphics memory. So I went out and downloaded all the graphics drivers, set it up, and... By the way guys, this game is not natively widescreen. At some point as a child, I probably installed a widescreen patch, cause usually there's these black bars at the side. I forgot how much I love this game, it's probably the best Need for Speed entry and probably the best racing game ever made. I just love the cars, the gameplay, the atmosphere, the music, the cutscenes. <laughs> okay, I've gotta move on, cause I'm gonna get lost in this game. Next up is GTA San Andreas. Man, this music always takes me back. Although there's something broken with this copy of the game, most of the dialogue is not present. To be fair, I don't necessarily love the base game, like it's great, I've beaten it once, but what I really loved was the Copland mod. Oh boy, back in the day I would just let the main story f*** off, go to the airport, get on a plane, use cheats, go to the next city and steal Lamborghinis and stuff. And last up is Max Payne. I never really played this game as a kid, it's a little before my time. But the moment the game booted up, the atmosphere it created made it immediately clear why people loved this game. The comic strip stories, the grungy dark New York setting, the poignant score, the game made it clear why it deserved all the love. Although, ignore my turbo gameplay, I don't really know how the controls work. Max Payne is an excellent example of Windows XP's compatibility, since I'm pretty sure it was written for the Windows 9X kernel because it'll run on Windows 98, but it works perfectly fine on Windows XP, and even Windows XP 64-bit. It's just something about this era where games felt like art rather than corporate cash-grabbing products. They had charm, they had this artistic sense, that wild freedom of expression that is sorely lacking in today's games. Like, look at the quit mini for Max Payne. Would any video game do this now? Or just the entirety of Need for Speed Most Wanted 2005? It has an aesthetic, a vibe, a sense of identity that is just not present in new Need for Speed games. And that sucks. But such were the times. Man, what an operating system. XP really did take over the world. It's probably sold more than half a billion copies worldwide, and that's the legal ones. If you've been around the world, you know that a lot of people didn't pay for operating systems. It's just one of those things that's just etched in that time period, like if you talk about the early 2000s, you've got to talk about XP and that iconic wallpaper. It's probably how people first experienced social media, like Facebook, or how people first started watching YouTube videos. So should you do what I've done and use XP in 2023? Absolutely not! Listen, yeah, not only is it super risky to use XP because it hasn't been patched for 9 years, it is ridiculously painful to use with anything modern. You know why I speed up these clips? Because it takes forever to load! It's just an interesting piece of history that a lot of people have taken great efforts to make it usable in this day and age. And it's not so that people can daily drive it, it's so that if the need ever arises to run retro software, some stuff that will absolutely not run on modern Windows, which does happen by the way, we can be assured that XP is still usable enough to get whatever it is that we need done. So we all love XP, bro, but 